Hello, YouTube, and welcome back to the African Allure Outdoors. Trust you folks are all keeping well. Uh, it is now almost December in sunny South Africa. It's hot. We're very blessed to have had some amazing rain, and uh, it's nice to see you guys again. It's been a little while. So today's topic is about the use of heavy arrows and light arrows and animals that string jump. In this video, I'm going to show you two examples, and the two examples are one of me shooting a warthog. This was about two years ago now, so it was some time back, and the warthog string jumps me pretty hard. And I hit him with a nice heavy arrow with a fixed blade broad head, and the warthog goes right down there. He was lucky. He was spined. And then the other video that I wish to, to show you is from a hunt that took place last weekend. So this was the weekend of the 20th of November. And uh, JP, who the hunter was in this video, actually took this footage with his, with his uh, iPhone. And it's just very nice to look at the footage and, and to actually just analyze and go through it. Now, I'm a heavy arrow fan. Most of you know that I like heavy arrows. I like shooting high FOC arrows. JP is a fast arrow man, um, so he's shooting 70 pounds, which is the same as me. Um, he's got a 28 and a half draw length draw length, 28.5 draw length. He's shooting 490 grains at 272 feet per second. His uh, kinetic energy is about 80, and his momentum is at, uh, is at 0.59. Now, on my arrows, I shoot 70 pounds. I've got a 32-inch draw length, um, 760 grains, 240 feet per second. And um, I'm shooting fixed blade broadheads, and I've got kinetic energy of around 97 and momentum of 0.80. So it's a substantial difference, especially in the momentum um, department there. Um, the other thing that is different is I, fix, I shoot fixed blade, whereas JP shoots one of those uh, forward deploying broadheads that opens up from the front. Now, in most cases, these fast arrows will work, um, especially at the short distances. JP's Impala was shot at 28 yards. My um, Warthog was shot, I think, at about 20... I would guess it was about 24 yards now. So there's probably about a four-yard dis differentiation, but it's it's not really that big. I think one of the things that we've got to look at when we shoot heavy arrows is that uh, you are going to have a bigger trajectory than you are with, you, with, a, with a fast arrow, fast light arrow, where you're going to have a straight tra trajectory. So one has got to learn how to use your pins or your slider, and you've got to work out how to accommodate that. I think the other thing as well is that there is definitely a point where you've got to say to yourself that you're willing to sacrifice so much trajectory um, by going to a heavier arrow. I think there are many guys, especially the guys that have shorter draw lengths, that just can't shoot a heavier arrow because they find the trajectory is just too great. Um, shooting a heavier arrow, amongst other things, does make your bow a lot quieter, and we will not overcome the speed of sound with a bow. Um, even the fastest bows, we still the speed of sound is still three times faster than three to four times faster than what our arrow can get there. So that animal is string jumping because it's reacting to the sound. So why not make our bows quieter that that animal is less likely to hear us and less re likely to react so violently to an arrow that's on its way there. Um, you'll see in the case of my warthog that that warthog was on his knees, so he couldn't necessarily drop, but he was able to roll away from the shot. And in so rolling away from the shot, he actually dropped the vitals down and I clipped one lung and I actually spined him. So he went right down there.
in JP's case, he was shooting an Impala, so an Impala will always be on its feet. And uh, in the case of a, a string jump, the animal actually drops down and it rolls away. Now, if we look at that in many respects, um, for my friends from the US, you'll know that a catcher's mitt that's used in baseball is to help absorb the energy of the ball that is transferred when catching it. Uh, for my friends that come out of Africa and those places where we play cricket, you think of a wicket keeper's gloves and they're able to catch that ball and break its momentum or break its energy down um, that it doesn't actually hurt your hands. Now in the perfect world, an animal that were to stand absolutely dead still and you were to put an arrow in it, um, you are not losing energy when that arrow passes through or hits that animal when it's absolutely stationary. Obviously when it starts cutting material and it starts cutting flesh and bone and stuff, then you're going to start losing its potential energy there. And this is where momentum is probably more superior than kinetic energy because, uh, you know, it's much easier to catch, say, a, a baseball or a cricket ball as to what it is catching a um, bowling ball. A bowling ball might be slower but you're not going to slow it down enough to actually not hurt yourself. So I think those are things to look at. Um, I think the, the, the big thing with the animals is that, you know, when they start rolling away, they're sort of absorbing that energy there. And uh, it, it definitely does have an impact. Um, you will see on JP's Impala that the animal um, not only drops down and it drops back, so it moves that arrow from actually perfectly placed behind the shoulder to in front of the shoulder into the neck, but the animal was also rolling away at the, at the same time. Unfortunately, we did not recover that animal. I've been looking for it for the last uh, week now. It was shot a, a week ago on Saturday the 21st of November. Today is the 29th of November, so it's exactly a week later. I've been looking for it for the last three days on smell, and I've had no success. We know that the animal was mortally wounded because there was not only a lot of blood, which there normally is with a flesh wound, but there was also rumen in that blood, and there were also bubbles, which means that both the esophagus and the trachea were, were compromised there. Um, I think the other thing that was challenging for us was during this hunt is that we had an, a huge volume of rainfall. So even with the dogs, we weren't able to get onto the blood and get a good blood trail with this animal. And I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we will find this animal at some stage. It might have got into the tree climbing mode and we might find that Mr. Spots has dragged it up a tree here because we have a vast amount of leopard here. We also have a lot of uh, predators and scavengers here on, on, on the property. So it's going to make it certainly very challenging. Um, I think the other thing that we need to consider is that uh, JP also uses a forward deploying broadhead and you lose a lot of energy with that. You know, it's got to make contact before it opens and you are absorbing energy there. Um, so these are just things to take into consideration, I think, when, when, when one is hunting. Um, obviously, I have a longer draw length than, than JP, so I have a lot more benefits than what he does. I can shoot heavier arrows faster is one thing. Uh, my trajectory is obviously a lot better. But I think one has got to find a compromise between the heavy arrows, trajectory, and 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 that sort of thing but i think the, the the key thing is to try and beat the sound if you can if you can just get your sound down as low as possible you're going to have less reaction from the animal and you're less likely to get away from string jumping i am going to be doing a video at some stage about uh signs to look for when the known string jumpers such as an impala uh, are going to string jump you there are some visible signs that you can look for um, and there are some things that you can do to mitigate the, um, the, the animal actually getting away from you. It's horrible, people, but it happens to all of us. It doesn't matter how, what your level of experience. You can be the most experienced bow hunter. You can shoot hundreds of animals a year, or you can only shoot one or two animals a year. Wounding is just one of those things that happens, and we've got to try and find a balance to 
make it less. It's not only sort of emotionally and ethically the right thing to do, but I think it's also just, uh, you know, it makes the lives of everyone all around just easier if it's clean.